Well, good morning. It is great to be with you. I've been looking forward to this time together for quite a while and uh, thankful that you are here this morning uh, as we talk about some, uh, some very important things in our lives uh, as Christians today. You know, back home I've got, uh, got an office, probably about 3,000 books uh, in my library there that I enjoy uh, very much. Two filing cabinets that are just cram full of stuff. There's not enough room to fit anything else in those, in those filing cabinets. But inside of those filing cabinets, there are three files that I treasure more than anything else in my entire office. Uh, I love books, and if you walked into my office, you would know that there's no more room for books either, but they continue to multiply somehow uh, on the shelves. But there's three files in those cabinets that are uh, more valuable than anything else there. I've got one file that I was told when I first started preaching, you need to save these, you need to put them in a file because there are going to be times when you want to go back and look at them. And that's, those are nice notes, nice cards that people have written uh, over the years to say nice things to me for whatever reason they chose to do that, I don't know. Uh, but I was told early on, you'll want to save those because there's going to be times in your preaching life where you wonder, what in the world am I doing and why am I doing this? And you might want to pull that file back out and just read some nice things that people actually had to say. Uh, and so I, I've got that file uh, in one of my cabinets. I've got another file that has cards and notes that my wife has written to me. Uh, I've got another file next to that that has cards and notes uh, that my two daughters uh, have uh, written and back in the day colored for me uh, and given to me. And so those three files inside of those cabinets are more valuable to me than anything else. When I think of something that's valuable, something that we've got in our hands, that is of more value than even those three files, I want you to hold your Bible in your hand today. And it, maybe you're using a, a phone or a tablet, and that's okay too, uh, as, as long as you're in the Bible app. Uh, you know, Facebook will be there when we get done, and, and uh, you know, solitaire. Uh, solitaire is meant to be played when you are solid, when you're by yourself, when you're in solitude, right? But uh, uh, so if, if you'll just stick in the Bible app with me, if that's where you are this morning, uh, but as I think about those files, those are something that I could never replace. Inside of that office, I've got every one of my books cataloged. Uh, if I needed to replace my books, and that, that's one of my greatest fears, uh, is, uh, you know, when I'm way like this, I think, you know, what if the, what if the building caught on fire? You know, I, you know, what if a hurricane came through and wiped it? You know, and I think about my library, and that's one of my most treasured, what would happen, you know, but I, I could replace everything in that library except for those three files. Those three files, I couldn't, I couldn't reproduce those. I, I couldn't bring those back and, uh, and have them in my possession if something happened to them. And so as I think about that, do we view the Bible as valuable as that? When we think about our Bible, do we see the Bible as something that is truly the most valuable thing, the most irreplaceable thing that I have in my life? You know, it's nice to have those cards and notes that people have written to me. And I love having those cards and notes that my wife and my girls have written to me. But do you know we've got an entire book of messages that our God has written to us? Those nice cards that people say, we appreciate you for this. Those nice cards from my wife that for, for whatever reason tells me how much she loves me. Don't compare to the messages that are in this book to, from God to tell us how much we mean to Him, to tell us how much He loves us. That, that thought, I, I mean, I, I, I know we know that thought, I know we recognize that thought, but that thought just boggles my mind, that we would have a book that would have those kind of messages to us from us. So I want to ask you this morning, how often do you engage with your Bible? How often do you pick up your Bible and open it? And I'm guessing that many of you have more than one copy of the Bible. Uh, maybe you've got one that you leave here on the pew at the building. You've got one at home and you've got one here or there. Uh, but how often do we engage with the Bible? Here's the trouble with those three files that I told you about. 
more valuable to me than anything else in my office? Can I uh, make a little confession to you this morning? Do you know how often I actually take those most valuable, treasured things to me, those files with notes? And, you know how often I've gone and opened those up and gone through them? Almost never. Is that shameful? I mean, in my, the most irreplaceable things that I've got there that I, I couldn't live without in my mind, and I yet, I don't pull them out. I, don't go, I know they're there. And when I open the drawer and I see the file, I'm like, I've got those. I know they're there. But I don't take them out and read them. Do we do that with this book? I know it's there. I know how valuable it is. I'm so thankful that I have it. I, I treasure it above all things. But how often do we actually open it up and spend time in it? And so the title of our lesson today is Engaging with Our Bibles. I want us to think today about what we have in this book. I want us to talk about, you know, why we should engage with it but, and talk about how we should engage with it. But I want us to talk about what we have in this book. When you think about the Bible, when you think about what we have in the Bible, and maybe you all will have to advance the slides. Um, I don't have a... I've lost control. Oh, here we go. All right, now, now we're there. I want you to think about what we've got in the Bible. What is the Bible? And I want to share with you some things about the Bible that ought to just fascinate us. There are th these are things we know, but as, as, as we put line upon line, as, as, as that expression is used in the Bible, as we put line upon line here on the screen and think about, here's what the Bible is. I want it to just fascinate us that this is what we have. The Bible is divine revelation. We have a message given to us by, by God. You know 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 16. All Scripture is given unto, unto us by the inspiration of God. It's from God. It's not from man. We've got a message that's been given to us by the God of heaven, by the creator of the universe. And as such, because it is divine revelation, it is inerrant revelation. What does that mean? This is a book that is free from error. You pick it up. When you pick up the newspaper every day, do you expect it to be inerrant? Uh, do you expect it to be free from error? Do you read along? You know, like, oh, well, they missed, they missed that. Oh, they missed that. They missed that one when they were going through as an editor. When we pick up the Bible, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 says, every word of God is pure. Some translations say every pure word of God is tested. It's proven. We pick this book up. And we can have absolute confidence. Isaiah chapter 45, God says, I give unto you, I write unto you I, I, those things that are right. R-I-G-H-T. I write that which is right. You pick up the Bible, it's an errant. Free from error. Aren't you thankful for that? It's not just an errant. It is infallible. It's not only free from error, it is incapable of error. Here's a book that it can't make a mistake. Well, you say, how can it not make a mistake? Go back to the first line. It's divine revelation. This is a book that's absolutely flawless because it was given to us by a God who is absolutely flawless. There's nothing in this book that we have that needs to be corrected. You know, there's often things that we write. You might pick up a book today and read through it and find some kind of typographical error and you think, you know, they need to go back and to fix that. But when we pick up our Bibles, free from error, we pick up our Bibles incapable of error because of the one who gave it to us. We pick up our Bibles, and this book is complete revelation. It's, got, it's the whole package. When Paul, when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he talked about when that which is perfect or complete has come, it came. In the first century, it was completed, and today we have that which doesn't need any addition to it. It's, it's the complete package. Aren't you thankful for that? When, doesn't it fascinate you that, you know, there's other books that you wouldn't say are necessarily complete. They may need to come along later and add another addition to it, and yet we've got that which is complete. We've got revelation from God that is sufficient revelation. It's complete, and it is sufficient, meaning it gives me everything that I need. Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, he says, you, you, you know the Holy Scriptures, that are, made, that are able to make you wise unto salvation. He says, you've got these. 
For, for here's a book that is given to us by the inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine. Here's a book that is sufficient to tell us what is right. It's profitable for doctrine. Here's a book that is sufficient to tell us what is wrong. It is profitable for reproof. Here's a book above all other books that is sufficient to tell us how to get right with God. Profitable for, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, to get right with God. Here's a book that's sufficient to tell me how to stay right with God. It's sufficient for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect. That the man of God may be complete. What does your Bible say? Somewhat furnished? A little bit furnished? Mostly furnished. Is that what your Bible says? How about thoroughly furnished unto every good work? I pick up my Bible, and I ought to be fascinated. Here's a book that's the complete revelation of God. Here's a book that is the sufficient revelation of God. Here's the book that is the final revelation of God. You ever watch that, uh, that show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And what was the question that, that Regis always asked? Is that your final answer? We pick up the Bible, and it's God's final revelation. Jude verse 3 says it has been once for all delivered. Literally, one time for all time, God's revelation has been delivered. That fascinates me. That encourages me. That comforts me. To know that when I have this, I'm not waiting for another revelation to come along. I'm not waiting. Well, maybe there's a piece missing. Maybe God's going to come along later and that. No, 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 no. It is final. We can have absolute confidence. I pick this up, and once I know what this book says, I know what God wants me to do. It's the final revelation of God. When we think about the Word of God, it is the authoritative revelation of God. You read through the book of Isaiah, and I've only got Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 2 up there, but actually 13 times in the book of Isaiah. And right here at the beginning, verse 1 is just, I am Isaiah, the son of Amos, here, and God appeared to me. So he's just introducing himself in verse 1, and then he gets to the prophecy, then he gets to the revelation of God in verse 2, and it says, the Lord has spoken. That's the book of Isaiah from the very beginning and 13 times through the book. The Lord has spoken. We pick up the Bible. What is the whole Bible? Not just the book of Isaiah. The Lord has spoken. It is the authoritative word of God. It is that which will judge us and determine whether we spend an eternity in heaven or an eternity in hell. Does that fascinate you? Does that enthrall you that that's what we have right here in our hands? We pick up our Bibles and we've got effectual revelation. It is, it will do exactly what God designed it to do. In Isaiah chapter 55, that's what God says down in verses 9, 10, and 11. That my word will not return unto me void. It will accomplish that which I please. Whatever God wants his word to do, it is effectual in doing it. I pick up this book and God tells me that his revelation is a there we go, an enduring revelation. Do you know books that have worn out over time? Do you know books that their message has worn out over time that maybe is not as, as effective as it was? Or do you know books that are no longer in existence today or, or messages that no longer are here? Here's a book that, in 1 Peter chapter 1, the Bible tells us that it is living, that it is living and abiding. That's, that, that, that's this revelation, that it lives and abides, how long? Forever. The, the, the grass withers, the flower fades away. You know that to be true. Men know that to be true. We spend all that money on those flowers and we bring them home. Here, I love you. And then after a few days, well, I guess I don't love you so much anymore because look at those sorry looking things. The flower fades away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 through 25. Aren't you thankful? You pick this up, and what they had in the first century, second century, third century, fourth century, we've, we've got it right here. Same revelation. And if the Lord allows the earth to stand, what are they going to have in the 22nd century? And in the 23rd, they're going to have the same thing that we have today. Doesn't it fascinate you to think about what we have in our hands? We've got an understandable revelation. It is, a, it is a revelation that is divine. It's from the God of heaven, the creator of the universe, whose mind is infinite, but he was able to get it down on our level so that we could understand it. What kind of God can do that? 
If you were asked to communicate a message to an ant, could you do that? Could you figure out how to communicate to an ant? I'm not talking, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, um, the, uh, the Marvel movie, you know, Ant-Man and, and you know, all, all the gears that, you know, all the things they did to, you know, be able to communicate. With, I, maybe, maybe you could figure that out. But imagine you trying to communicate to an ant, to tell an ant how you feel about it, to tell an ant what you would like it. You think that's ridiculous. I could, I could never get that. Think about God trying to communicate to us. The infinite God, the almighty all-sufficient, the all-loving, the, omni, uh, the omnipotent, the omniscient God. You put in all of the attributes of God, and he's trying to communicate to us in a way that our little finite, puny minds could understand it. And yet he did. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, when you read that which, is, which I have written, you will understand. He told him in Ephesians 5 verse 17, understand what the will of the Lord is. It's possible for us to do that. And because it is an understandable revelation, we know that it is a rational revelation. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, God says, Come, let's reason together. Here's a book that can be explained. Here's a book that can be not just understood, but I can reason through it. I can rationalize through it, and I can help others to see what it says. That's fascinating to me. Here's a book that's not just understandable and it's rational and reasonable, but it's a book that is relevant to me. It's a book that's 2,000 years old. How many books that are hundreds of years old are still relevant to us? We mentioned the other day about, you know, the 1955 edition of the Good Housewife's Guide. You know, is that still relevant? We mentioned the 1975 edition of the IBM's Word Processor User's Guide. Is that still relevant today? No. Here's a book that's 2,000 years old, some parts of it 3,500 years old. Still just as relevant today as it was when it was written. It is living, and Hebrews 4, 4 verse 12 says it's living and active, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to, to, to pierce to the division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and it's, the, it's, it's able to discern the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. That's real. That's relevant to our lives. When you think about this revelation given to us by God, it is a, finally on this slide, a heaven-dependent revelation. Do you want to go to heaven? Amen. I, there's nothing more that I want to do than to go to heaven. There are some days that I think about that more than others. I don't know about you, but there are some days that I pray and say to God, God, today would be a good day for you to come back. I wouldn't mind if it was today. Some days, there's days I'm driving to the office and I'm like, Lord, you said you, that Jesus is going to come back on a cloud and with the clouds. And I'm like, there's some clouds right there. Those are looking pretty good, Lord. Do you know he, he, he could use those? You know, it's, are you ready to go to heaven? In order to go to heaven, Jesus says, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And that's what we've got. We've got in our hands a Bible that is heaven-dependent revelation. When Jesus looked at his disciples, after many of them turned and departed from him, he says, you also are going to depart from me? And Peter says, to whom shall we go, Lord? You've got the words of eternal life, John 6 and verse 68. And we've got those today. I wanted this morning to start just talking about what the Bible is. Because to me, when I think about what the Bible is, it just fascinates me that we've got it. I want to go back and ask you the question. How often do you engage with this book? You've got a book that fascinates us because of the kind of revelation it is, and you've got it in your possession. It's not that you only have it every once in a while. You've got it every single day of your life in your possession. Should that not be something that you run to, that you, that you want to absorb as much as you possibly can? What it is ought to fascinate us. What it provides, what it does... That ought to motivate us. What does the Bible provide for us? What does it give to us? We've talked about what it is, but okay, what does it do now? What does it provide for me? The Bible is God's source of truth. I know you know that, but let that settle in. It is God's source of truth. Not my truth. 
Not your truth. Not somebody else's truth. Not just any old truth. It is God's source of truth. Jesus says, sanctify them by thy word. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. I pick up this book and I, I've, got, I've got God's truth about God. I've got God's truth about man and who mankind is, what mankind is, what he expects of mankind. I, I've got God's truth about the home, about the family. I've got God's truth about what husbands and wives are to be, what fathers and mothers are to be, what children are to be and to do. I've got, I've got, that, I've got that truth right here. I've got God's truth about how he wants me to live. I've got God's truth about doctrine. What must I do to be saved? I've got God's truth on that. How, how do I need to worship God? I've got God's truth on that. What about morality? I've got God's truth on morality. What kind of revelation is that? Relevant revelation. What kind of revelation is that? Enduring revelation. Has God's truth on morality changed? Maybe to fit the culture, maybe to fit the day, maybe it's got some wiggle room in it. God's truth doesn't change. And so I come to God's truth, and He provides me with truth on morality. He provides me with truth on gender. He provides me with truth on sexuality. He provides me with truth on all of those things that are affecting us today, all of those things that are being discussed today. He's got, I've got it. He provides me, not with just somebody's truth, not with just some truth that's going to change. Remember, it is a complete, sufficient, final revelation. When I know what God says about truth, that truth isn't going to change. That ought to motivate us to get into this book. When I think about what this book provides, this book provides God's source of wisdom. You want wisdom? Here's the place to come. You want a better understanding about life? Here's the place to come. It gives understanding to the simple. Psalm 119 and verse 130 tells us, it is God's source of faith. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. How strong is your faith? You know, sometimes we use Romans 10 and verse 17 to talk about, you know, somebody who has, just doesn't believe. They've never had any faith in Jesus. They don't know who Jesus is, and so we'll use, we'll use Romans 1 and verse 17 to say, well, what they need to do to be saved, what they need to do to become a Christian is they need to hear the Word, because hearing the Word produces faith in their hearts, and that's absolutely true. But it doesn't stop. The more I go back to the Word of God, the more it feeds my faith. How strong is your faith? Brethren, we're getting ready. We're not, we are all ready, but we are, ready, we are getting ready to endure some pretty severe storms as Christians. Our society is going to make it increasingly difficult for us to be individuals who believe God's truth and stand for God's truth. How strong is your faith to weather those storms? You want to increase your faith? <laughs> he gives it to us. This is God's source for us to have that. We pick up this book, and it is God's source of growth. If I want to grow, if I want to become stronger, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 says, Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You know, you think about that little baby who comes into the world and how cute those little babies are. Isn't it amazing? You know, those cute little babies grow up to be teenagers. And you're like, wait a minute, what happened? You used to be really cute. I'm just kidding. All right, but um, you come, these babies come into the world and they need all sorts of nourishment. They need all sorts of care. They cannot survive on their own. We have new converts. We have individuals who are baptized into Christ and all of a sudden, we think they can stand on their own. We think, oh, you've been baptized. Oh, good, we got, we got you in the water, got you out of the water. All right, you're sufficient to stand on your own. No, oh, here's God's source of growth for us to help them to increase their faith, for us to help them to grow in their service to the Lord. And it ought to motivate us to get into this book and say, that's what God wants from me. This book provides for us God's source of guidance. 
There's all sorts of people that just have this idea, well, I, you know, I, I, I asked God to tell me what to do. I, I'm just waiting for God to show me the way. He's given you over a thousand pages in my Bible, over a thousand pages of information to tell you where to go and how to do it. It's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, Psalm 119 and verse 105. Well, why do I need a lamp? Why do I need a light? Because I'm walking around in a world of darkness. How do I know where to go in this world of darkness? I pick up this book that provides to me God's source of guidance for my life. Jeremiah 10 and verse, uh, verse 23 says, The way of man, it's not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his steps. Well, Lord, how am I supposed to direct my steps? He says, I'm telling you right here. It's God's source of guidance. I pick up this book, and I'm, I'm going to put these next several up because they, uh, I try to separate them in my mind, and then they kept running together in my mind. It's God's source of power. It's God's source of power to save me. James 1 and verse 21, that, that you, you uh, here's this, the word of God that you pick up, and it is, it is powerful enough to save us from our sins if I'll pick it up and do what it says. It's powerful enough to transform me, to take me from the kind of individual I don't need to be, to transform me into the kind of person that I need to be. It's the, it's the book that takes me and it sanctifies me. It takes me from being an unholy individual in the eyes of God and it sets me apart and makes me a holy individual set apart for His service in the eyes of God. Nobody else can do that for me. This book can, because it is God's source to provide all of those things for me. It is God's source to provide for me that which, there we go, gives me confidence. Turn for just a minute to Luke chapter 1. I know we've been mentioning a lot of verses, but I, I, I love how Luke begins his gospel account. Luke is writing to a man by the name of Theophilus. We don't know anything else other than that about the man. He writes the book of Luke. He writes the book of Acts to this most excellent Theophilus. And he's writing to him about Jesus in the book of Luke. And as he writes this, he writes, look in Luke chapter 1. And as much as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses. They, they saw this. They were ministers of the, the, and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me, Luke says also having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, I wanted to write unto you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. Luke, why did you want to do that? Look in verse 4. I, my Bible in verse 4 starts with the word that. Here's the reason. I'm writing these things to you in an orderly account. Luke, why are you doing that? That you may know. What have you got? The certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Theophilus, I, I don't want you to just, you know, think that you, you've heard some things and somebody just kind of made these up. You know, they were following some uh, cunningly devised fable, you know, when they were doing that. I want you to have absolute certainty that these things are true. You pick up the Bible. It is your source of confidence. You can have absolute certainty in every word of this book that it is given to us by God and it is something for us to devote our lives to following. It is God's source of comfort. We know Romans 15 and verse 4, those things that are written aforetime were written for our learning, but sometimes we stop there. The rest of the verse says that for that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Do you find comfort in this book? Do you have your favorite psalm? Do you have your, so your psalm? You, nobody else can have it. It's your psalm. Do you have your psalm that when you're in those difficult days, you run to that psalm, and it comforts you. This book is God's source of happiness. In Jeremiah chapter 15, Jeremiah says in verse 16, Your words were found, and I ate them. Think about that. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting that you need to physically eat the Word of God. But Jeremiah says, I found your words and I took them in as desperately as I could, as close as I could. And he says, your words were found and I ate them and your words were to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. 
I find God's word and it just fills me with happiness and joy. Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, he said, blessed are those who hear and do these words. The word blessed means happy. Is that us? Last thing I want you to th see about what God's word is to us. It is God's source of victory. You want to be victorious? Here's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. There is no battle that we can lose when we live by, teach by, and hold by the Word of God. As we started, as we began, and as we focused some things in this lesson today, I wanted to spend some time just talking to you about what the Bible is. And as we had all of those things about what kind of revelation is, I just want that to fascinate. It fascinates me. I hope it fascinates you. I want us to talk about what the Bible provides, what God, what it does, what it gives to us, because that ought to motivate, this is what he, God's giving this to me. This is God's source for, that ought to motivate me to, to get into this book. And so for the last few minutes of this lesson, what I want to do is I want to talk about what the Bible wants. What the Bible is, it ought to fascinate us. What the Bible provides, that ought to motivate us. What the Bible wants, well, that might challenge us. But that's okay. I think we need to be challenged. And we're going to spend the most time on this first one, just talking about what the Bible wants. The Bible wants us to read it. I know you know that. I know that's about as fundamental as you can get. The Bible wants you to read it. How often did Jesus encounter some individuals and he would say something to the effect of, have you not read? It's like, what's Jesus saying? It's right there in the book. It's been there for hundreds of years. Have you not read? I wonder if Jesus could look at one of us and say, have you not read? It's been there for thousands of years. It's got all of that for you. Have you not read? The Bible wants us to read it. Now, how do you read the Bible? <laughs> so that's kind of a silly question, preacher. What do you mean, how do you read the Bible? How, how do you read the Bible? I think probably most folks, when they think about reading the Bible, they think about just picking it up and reading and from page one and reading it cover to cover because that's the way that you would read any book. And that's, that is one of the best ways to read the Bible. But I want to suggest to you that's not the only way to read the Bible. Do you like variety in your physical diet? Do you like variety in your diet? Or do you just eat the same thing every day, day after day after day? Do you, do you like variety? When you go to a restaurant, do you like that they have a, sometimes I don't like the fact they have a menu because it's like this is overwhelming. You know, I'm just like, just give me what I'm looking for, right? Just give me the basics. All this, and then they put all this verbiage in there with these fancy words about food. I'm like, is that chicken? I mean, I, I'm trying to figure out what they're serving me here. I'm like, I don't understand these fancy words. Just tell me, is that chicken or is that beef? But do you like variety in your diet? Or do you just eat the, you know, you like variety, don't you? Do you eat the same thing for lunch that you eat for breakfast? Do you eat the same thing for dinner that you eat for breakfast? Do you like to have snacks during the day? Are you a snack person? Do you have a drawer at work that's got your snacks, got your little pick-me-ups inside the drawer? Do, do you like cookies? Do, now, do you eat cookies for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? I mean, maybe you do. Fantastic. I hope you do. Do you like, do you, you like variety? And you like variety, don't you? You know, you go to the store. Have you ever been to the store and you're walking up and down the aisle? You're like, oh, I didn't even know they had that. I need to try that. Variety. You like variety. What about variety in this diet? Can you have variety in your diet when you come to read the Bible? Obviously, we can read the Bible cover to cover. And I grew up on the diet of reading the Bible cover to cover. And reading and, and having, that, having that schedule that you read the Bible through in a year. And I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you. It, it'll take you about three chapters a day. And in three chapters a day, you can read through the Bible in about a year. I want to encourage you not just to read through it in the same translation. I know several people that one year they'll read it out of maybe the King James, the next year they'll read it out of the, the American Standard, next year they're going to read it out of the ESV. They read out of a different translation every year. I think that's a good practice because you're, you're, you're familiar with your translation, the one you always use, and then you read it through another translation. You're like, oh, 
Well, I, I, I'd never seen it that way. I never thought of it that way. But sometimes, for some of us, reading through the Bible in a year, three chapters a day, that, that can seem like a pretty big task. Especially when you get a few days behind, and then you're like nine chapters behind. And then, and then it's like, okay, well, I, I, I can't catch up. So what about instead of reading it cover to cover in a year, what about in three years? What about take your time? You know there's not a verse that tells us to read through the Bible in a year? <laughs> All the, most of the reading programs out there for years were read through the Bible in a year. There's not a verse that says you have 365 days, you better get started. You could read it in three years. You could take two years on the Old Testament. Take one year on the New Testament. There's 1,189 chapters in the Bible. You divide that up. Figure out how that works. But take your time. Read it at a different place. See, you can have variety in your diet. But even more than that, what about just reading through the New Testament in one year? And that, that's a part of that three-year program. But what if you just take a year? There's 160 chapters in the New Testament. Sorry, 260 chapters in the New Testament. What if you just read through those chapters in a year? We're doing that in, at, at Palm Beach Lakes, the congregation where, um, where we're from. We're reading through the New Testament this year as a congregation. We're reading five chapters a week. Um, and just a cha basically a chapter a day, but five chapters a week, reading through the New Testament. You, you see more when you slow down a little bit. Um, is that true when you're driving? When, when you're flying down the highway at 90 miles an hour? Yeah, I know some of you do. When you're flying down the highway at 90 miles an hour, sometimes you don't see everything, right? You know, your wife says, hey, did you see that? You're like, no, I'm looking at the road. You know, but if you're driving down the highway at 25 miles an hour, are you going to see more? Yeah, you're going to see a whole lot more. You're going to see some people that are pretty upset with you driving 25 miles. But you're going to see more when you slow down when you're driving. Same is true about the book. You're going, to, you're going to see more if you slow down a little bit. What about if you read it chronologically? There are Bibles that you can buy that are written, and, and they're, instead of having you know Genesis through Revelation, those 66 books in, in, in that order, there are Bibles you can buy that are in a chronological order. Or you can just use an app, or you can, you can download a reading schedule and print that off and then go and read it in your own Bible. It's fascinating to read the Bible in chronological order because you just think, oh, Genesis, all right, I'm going to start there, and I'm going to go here. And, and, but when you see, wait a minute, so when I'm reading through 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles, you mean all of these books at the end of the Old Testament come over here and they fit? Oh, oh well, that's different. So now I'm putting the prophets in a... Oh, so that's where this fits. Gives you a different perspective. Puts things in context for you. So maybe one time when you're going through the Bible, instead of reading it cover to cover, you say, okay, I think I'm going to try it chronologically and see, see how this works and see if that helps me to understand things in, in, in more of a context. What about just reading, you're, you're still trying to read through the Bible, maybe in a year or two years. This is the plan that I grew up on. I, I don't know why, I think my mom just had one of these cards printed out um, and uh, with a reading schedule and it had a little bit of the Old Testament every day, a little bit of the New Testament every day. It had a few verses out of Psalms and it had a few verses out of Proverbs. Um, and I, I, that's just, that was the reading program I knew as a little kid because that's what my mom had. That's, that's a pretty cool way to read the Bible you, because every day you're getting a little bit out of Psalms. That helps. Every day you're getting a little bit out of Proverbs. It tells you, watch your tongue, buddy. Watch your attitude. Don't be lazy. You know, and so you're, you're getting all of this on a daily basis. That's, that's a, a good way to come and to read through it. What about just reading a chapter or a, just a paragraph a day? It's not a race. Sometimes we think, oh, I've got to keep up with this. I, I, I love the Bibles that are, that are printed today, and, and most of the modern translations are this way, that, that have chapter division. Not just, sorry, not just chapter division, but paragraph divisions, where it blocks off a paragraph. What if you just go and just read a paragraph a day? Take your time. Take your time and look through this and see, okay, what's here for me? What's going on in this context? Again, variety in your diet. What, what about reading through a book in one sitting? Now, with Isaiah, that, that, that'll be a long day. You know, with Jeremiah, you know, that might be, you might break that up into two or three days. But what, what, if, what if you sat down, even with the book of Romans, even the book of 1 Corinthians, but you might like the shorter, you know, maybe you just want a snack, and so you go to the book of Philippians. But what if you just sit down and you read through an entire book in one sitting? 
That's going to help you. And what if you did that for a whole week? Just read the same book. Read Philippians on Monday. Read Philippians on Tuesday. Read Philippians on, on Wednesday. What if you read through it for two weeks? Would that get Philippians in your brain, in your heart, in your mind? Brother, Brother Tom Holland wrote, uh, he wrote a series of, of sermon outline books on the New Testament. So every, I think it was every book, near, uh, yeah, every book of the New Testament, uh, he, had, he had written a, uh, some sermon outlines uh, on those. And, and what he said in, in one, of his, uh, one of his lectures about, I guess, about those books, but I, hear him I heard him talk about it. He said, before I, you know, before I did the one on Romans, he said, here's, here's his words. He said, I lived with Romans for a year before I wrote the sermon outlines. I love that, that, that phraseology. I lived with Romans for a year. What if you lived with Philippians for a week? What if you've lived with Philippians for a month? I mean, you, yes, there's other books, and, you, and you'll get to them. But what if you just digested a book, uh, first, first Peter, Second Peter, and it just became a part of your soul? And then you go on to another book. You see, variety, it, and it's giving you another perspective on, on, on your diet, another perspective on the Word of God. What about just reading a little pieces at a time? You get up in the morning, just read a couple verses. That's it. Okay, I'm going to think about those verses today. Before you go to bed, you read a couple verses. Just a couple verses over here. Uh, and, and I've got to explain this. What do you mean red light? Um, we had one of our widows. She had one of those little New Testaments. Um, and you know what I'm talking about? One of those little two New Testaments. She left it sitting open wherever she was in the Bible. She left it sitting open on her passenger seat. So whenever she... I, I'm not giving you driving advice, okay? But whenever she came to a red light, she would just reach over, pick up her New Testament, read the next verse, put it over there, and she'd think about that verse until she got to the next red light. I mean, just little, little bites, right? Little pieces. And, and, and she would think about that. Uh, I'm not going to have time to get to it later on. Um, but uh, my grandfather, when uh, he would, uh, uh, you know, as, as, men, as men age, we have to get up in the middle of the night, right? So when my grandfather... When he would have to get up in the middle of the night, he'd switch on the light so he wouldn't, you know, stub his toe going back and forth to the restroom. But when he came back, sat down on the side of the bed, he opened up his Bible, read a verse, switched the light off, laid down, and he thought about that verse until he fell asleep. Just little pieces. You don't, you don't, have, to read, you don't have to read the whole book in a day. Just little pieces here and there. God, the Bible wants us to read it. Sometimes I will be asked by individuals who have never read the Bible, I've never read the Bible. Where should I start? And usually we would say, well, on page one would be a good place to start. I mean, that's where you normally start a book, right? I've gotten over the last 10 or 20 years, I don't know how long, somebody who's never read the Bible to say, just start in the book of John. Never read the Bible? That book is written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. What a better place to start than to tell you about Jesus, what he's done, and what, what he expects out of us. And then I'll tell him, you know what? When you get done with that, John, guess what the next book is? It's the book of Acts. You're right there. Read about the early church. Read about those early Christians and what they did. And then I'll say, okay, you know what? Then you can go back and you can read them, start in Matthew, and you can read through the whole New Testament. And then you can go back and start in the Old Testament, and guess what? When you start in the Old Testament, you know where you're going. You know where it's going to end up. You've already seen the end. So when you're reading through some of those difficult texts in the Old Testament about animal sacrifices and, and other feast days, you're like, what is this all about? I already know what it's all about because I've already seen the end. I already know where this is going. When I pick up the Bible, perhaps you might read it out loud. I know that may make you uncomfortable. Maybe you do this when nobody else is around. But have you ever read the Bible out loud? You think that's kind of weird. When you read it out loud, it's different. I don't know why. It's different. When the Ethiopian eunuch was riding along in the chariot and he says he was reading from Isaiah chapter 53, he was reading it out loud. Philip heard him reading. Have you ever read the Bible? It, it, it'll, it'll, I, I, it'll change. It'll change what, the, the, way, the way that you hear it uh, when you're reading it out loud. And then there's just, you know, there's, there's Bible apps. And some of them, I almost didn't put this on here. Uh, and after I sent it to Randy last night, I was like, mm, I don't know if I want that on there because there's some Bible apps I don't like. But I'm just talking about reading schedules. I'm not talking about teaching apps. I'm just talking about ones that will just give you a variety of ways to read the Bible. Can we engage with this book? Can we get into it? 
and just read it. I, 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 do not, I do not have time because I have a minute left. I don't have time to talk about studying it. Studying it is going on a different level. You read it, you're just reading but studying it is taking it to a different level. I don't have time to talk to you about meditating on it. That's my grandfather, just taking a verse and meditating on it. I don't have time to talk to you about memorizing it. Oh, I wish we would memorize the Bible. We had one of our deacons years ago who was a uh, Florida Highway Patrolman. And uh, I'll finish with this. I know the bell's going to ring. He was a Florida Highway Patrolman. And uh, this, is, this is the day before cell phones, all right? And so he had taken some three-by-five cards, and he had taken Romans chapter 12, 21 chapters in Romans chapter 12. He took 21 three-by-five cards. He wrote verse 1 on this card, took another card, wrote verse 2 on it, punched a hole up in the top corner, put one of those, those rings, those metal rings on, to wrap them together. He had 21 cards with 21 verses for Romans chapter 12. And whenever he was sitting in his patrol car, he had that stack of three-by-five cards sitting up on the corner of his dash. And whenever he was able to sit, he had paperwork done, he was sitting, you know, whatever, whatever highway patrolmen do when there's nothing else to do, he would pull those cards off, look at it, quote it in his head, flip the next card. Do I have this one? Romans chapter 12, is that a chapter for us to write on our heart? Every last word of it? I want to... The Bible, what it wants, is challenging. It wants us to read it, to study it, to meditate on it, to memorize it. It wants us to love it, to desire it, to feed on it. I hope we'll engage with it. Thank you all very much for your attention this morning.